there we go. Um, I want to welcome you all um, today. Um, it's a little different being virtual, but I think we've somewhat mastered it hopefully over the last um, school year pretty much. Um, we want to welcome you here and I want to start a little bit to tell you about the Marsh Union Jointure Commission. I'm the assistant superintendent of the Marsh Union Jointure Commission. Um, we have several programs in the program um, that I wanted to talk to you before Mike Selps um, begins is really our new um, ERI program, which is really um, a formerly BD program, right? Um, and what we are going to do this coming year is take our program, which is currently three classes, and move it over to our Developmental Learning Center in Warren. So Warren um, is, is a program where um, we currently have students with autism. So um, the program really focuses on students um, with social regulation difficulty. Um, and we really stress social emotional learning. And what we have is the fortunate of having Dr. Selps with us as a, as a consultant. And this coming year, we are also adding a consultant of the school psychiatrist. So we will have psychiatrists and psychologists as consultation services, as well as we have a social worker, school psychologist, um, and then we also have the ability to have different related service providers if that's contracted. So I don't want to take up much time. I want to show you a short video and then I'm going to hand it right over to Dr. Selps. Welcome to Eagle Plain. Today's date, so 4 14. Great, so let's write it. I love it. And the time is 10 20, right? I just looked at my clock, so I can you. And now what's our observation that it's doing what? Yeah. And then you're going to demonstrate a coping skill or say something that's related to coping. So are you, are you ready in your mind about what you want to do with that? Yeah. Do you want to tell me or do you want to just try it? I want to tell the tell me. Right. Can I use the computer? Uh not now. So when do I use it? Uh good good thinking. I will let you use it after you finish that assignment that I just gave you, the writing assignment. All right. Oh, what a great job. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Thanks for visiting our class. There we go. Welcome to Eagle Three. Has that stopped sharing now? Okay. Yes. So, as you can see, um, we are going to be moving that program over to our DLC Warren. Um, if you have any um, records that you would like to send or um, know of a child that may benefit from the program, um, after this, you will receive the brochure that has all contact information, and you can certainly send any records or anything, and we can talk to one of the principals or myself about a possible placement and our ERI program. Right now, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Seltz so that he will be presenting to you for the next hour or so. So thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. It's really my honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to present this webinar this morning. I just want to remind- Mike, I can't hear you. Oh, you're not able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes or no? Uh, panelists are saying they can hear me. So maybe your sound is down. They can hear you. Participants are saying they can hear you. Can hear me, Denise? Okay. Everybody's saying they can hear me, so I'm going to I'm going to proceed. So I appreciate uh, appreciate the feedback. Um, okay, I'll get started. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. So. I've had the opportunity to consult to the DLC for several years. Uh, my background briefly is that I'm a licensed psychologist in New Jersey, as well as in Pennsylvania. I'm also a certified school psychologist and I'm a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. I provide consultation, training, individual therapy, group therapy, family therapy, behavioral parent training as well, and uh, as well as social skills groups and evaluations and, and support to children, adolescents, adults, families, and to school districts. So this webinar, which we're focusing on emotional regulation impairment and specifically emotional regulation supports and strategies. So I hope that you find the information to be helpful. We will be providing you a copy of the PowerPoint uh, shortly after the completion of the webinar. So you'll have the full PowerPoint, all the information that we'll be providing as we go through today. Um, hopefully, we'll have at least some brief time for some Q&A as we go through. So I will allow at least a few minutes before the conclusion at, at 1030 so that we have a few minutes to entertain that. But if you do have some questions or some comments that we don't have sufficient time to address, feel free to just email me. Uh, my email is on the first slide, which everybody, again, will have an opportunity to receive. So we'll talk a bit about challenging behavior understanding some of the tenets of what contributes to challenging behavior and really with a strong focus on what are those supports to address emotional regulation impairment. If you're not familiar with that term, uh, that's really the new term as part of the special education code that um, is replacing the um, emotional disturbance or emotional disability and uh, emotional regulation impairment, I, I would agree, really much better captures the deficit and difficulty that many of our youth are demonstrating and experiencing across situations and, and settings. So we'll talk a little bit about those difficulties, interventions and supports, and what are those best practices components that would lead to providing social emotional learning across a various situations, particularly with an emphasis in the educational support uh, situation. So how does it impact our settings? How does it impact our students? Well, we know that certainly seeing challenging behavior from one child not only impacts their own educational functioning, but others who are in that same environment. It makes it much harder for the 
educator, the classroom teacher, and the assistants to provide the appropriate educational supports. And it can impact the overall school environment in terms of allotment of resources, uh, attending to the individual needs that students have, and that can also carry over to family situations. I wanna share a couple videos, and these three video sequences really were just a couple minutes apart. And this occurred in our summer treatment program some years ago. Of course, we have permission from any of the children that you see or hear on, on the video. And this is a child who we had a behavioral plan that was in place because he was demonstrating difficulties with his compliance. And what he tended to do was to show some oppositional defined behavior verbally. And on occasion, he would become physical and he might turn over a chair. He hadn't thrown any chairs, but uh, because he was not responding to some of the preliminary interventions that we had, including a more traditional reinforcement system, we added a correction procedure where when he turned over chairs, he needed to not only pick up those chairs, but to straighten or pick up additional chairs in the classroom. So you'll see already in this video, uh, in, in the photo that there are some chairs that are down and the prompt was for him to go ahead and pick them up. Uh, this also followed defiance where we wanted him to practice doing a phone call. I know a phone call is kind of a, a lost art, but it's, it's still an important skill. So we were practicing a phone call. He, Justin was upset that we were practicing and didn't want to practice it multiple times. So he turned the chair over and his anger increased. So you'll see uh, where we're prompting him to pick up the uh, the chairs and get calm and to calm. He had to calm on my perfect day. He made me do a stupid fuck up twenty times. too happy about picking up the chairs and he's picking up the chairs if you couldn't make it out he kept saying fat man stop recording me so he was uh, name calling to me and was upset uh, although again ultimately um, you know he gave permission his parent gave permission in advance to, to record uh, you might have been observing some planned ignoring that is the staff were reinforcing the other students good job ignoring good job working Mallory uh, they were walking around and delivering behavior specific praise to the other students. And then just a couple minutes later, here's the. Uh -huh. We're going to sit at the table. Okay. And this outfit will be tight. Okay. 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 Okay.
real hard time demonstrating that behavior where and when needed, which is often what Justin's doing. And you can see that he goes from holding up that chair and he's so angry, gesturing he's going to throw it at me and calling me names to I'm calm and just turning like a dime to the next sequence. And then here's the third part of it. Oh. Hey, this is Justin. Would you like to come to my house today? Yeah, I would love to come to your house today. Okay. All right. See you later. All right, goodbye. Excuse me. Okay, we have four more. Ring, 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 ring. Hello? Hey, this is Justin. Would you like to come to my house and play today? Justin, I would love to come over. What time? 15 minutes. Okay, great. I'll check with my mom and I'll come over. Okay. Bye. Three more, right? Yeah. No, it's two. Remember? Two more left? Two more left. Okay. Ring, 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 ring. Hello? Hey, this is Justin. Would you like to come to my house today? Sure, I'd love to, Justin. Okay, see you later. All right, see ya. Okay, one more. Ring, 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 ring. Hello? Hey, this is Justin. Would you like to come to my house today? Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, what time were you thinking? 15 minutes. Um, yeah, w what can we do? Uh, we can play GameCube. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. I'll see you in a little while. See you in a little while. All right, bye. Bye. Great job, Justin. So you might have noticed that Justin thought there were only two left when there were actually three. And that was one of those that I was just not going to fight that battle. I, I figured we had his participation. He was now practicing the additional practice correction pr procedure of practicing the, the phone call. You can see that his body language is a lot calmer. His facial expression is a lot calmer. He's a lot more engaged now. And this was really only about 10 to 12 minutes from the start of the first video. So he was able to rebound pretty quickly. And through the course of the program, we're able to see a great deal of improvement with his regulation because of the practice proactively of helping him to work on the breathing and communicating his feelings and role-playing situations that tended to be triggers for him. And those kinds of things we'll be talking about as we go through this morning. I remember seeing this slide or this picture in a K-2 self-contained class a number of years back, and it really rang true for me because if you think about this, the kids who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving of ways. And those of you who are in the behavioral field, you know the, the term functional communication and functional communication training and how critical it is to help the child to be able to communicate what their behavior would otherwise be telling us. And the key for us as educators is to really understand what is the behavior communicating to us and help that child to have a more functionally appropriate way of conveying what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what their needs are, what they want, what they don't want. Because for so many of our individuals, regardless of their cognitive and communication skills, they often struggle with appropriately communicating those emotions, those thoughts, and we end up seeing very challenging behavior. So how does this manifest? How does it present in a school setting or in any setting, really? We see noncompliance, defiance, oppositional and argumentative behavior. Sometimes we see the child who may be calling out or conversely more withdrawal behavior where they're falling asleep or they're getting up and they're running around, they're out of their seat. Some of that may be contributed by some ADHD symptoms, uh, particularly when there's fidgeting, hyperactivity, significant impulsivity. Sometimes we see aggression, physical, verbal aggression toward others. Sometimes that's harm or threats towards themselves. Uh, sometimes we might see cutting behavior and unfortunately we see more and more of that physical cutting behavior and there's a real strong peer influence unfortunately in some situations in some schools i've seen where that becomes quote unquote the the in thing to do that if you're cutting oh gosh you're you're with the cool group and it's just really really sad to see that there's a positive peer pressure unfortunately that contributes uh, to that sometimes we see destruction of property which could range from defacing a piece of paper to ripping it up to more much more significant damage potentially to um, the environment. Sometimes there's school avoidance or school refusal, and there are a lot of functions that could be contributing to that, just getting the child to come into the building, getting the child to leave their house, or to even further to get out of bed. And that could be because they're escaping and avoiding something that is difficult. We see this more and more, unfortunately, recently through this pandemic, children who are feeling a great deal of anxiety or apprehensive to leave the house and to go out where they might potentially get sick or concerned where they might bring something back to their family and or concerns where they're worried about how their parent might be whom they haven't left for a long period of time. 
Uh, we hear that in lots of different respects with even just going out to a restaurant or going out to a mall, but certainly leaving school, we've seen a great uptick in this, unfortunately, as more and more children are returning to in-person learning. And depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, we're seeing also greater chatter about um, trauma-informed work. So working on the, the grief, the adjustment issues, uh, bereavement that may have occurred, uh, but certainly overall uh, coping with the stressors that are in an individual's life. And that may play out from sadness to significant depression or a mild level of discomfort to a great deal of anxiety. And for those who have suffered either loss or some other tragedy, especially during this pandemic, we might be noticing some symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder among some of our youth. So what contributes to this? Certainly we know that poor self-regulation contributes and we'll talk more and more about that. The significant stressors that we're talking about and I just mentioned in the previous slide uh, really uh, tend to contribute to this as well. We see many, many youth who start to, to demonstrate symptoms of depression and anxiety during the middle school years. And we start to see some hints of that during elementary school. During the elementary school years, while we may not necessarily think of it as significant depression or anxiety, we should know that how anxiety and or depression are manifested, presented among elementary school children may be through oppositional behavior, non-compliance, defiance, aggression. So we might even call that a, um, you know, a depression lookalike or an aggression lookalike or an ADHD lookalike, meaning that an individual who's experiencing significant emotional distress may demonstrate that in lots of different ways, either externalizing aggression, oppositional defiant behavior, or more internalized through withdrawal and anxiety and depression. And just know that we need to be very mindful about how they might be presenting that and what that may mean. So it's a different level and, and way of looking at function. It's not just, well, he or she is doing it for attention or they're doing it because they want to escape a or avoid, but really taking some time to have some appreciation for emotionally what they may be experiencing. We're also seeing more and more youth who are disaffected and disconnected, not finding their place in a school environment, and that can contribute to feeling more detached and emotional regulation difficulties might be heightened as well. For individuals that have academic difficulties or as a result of their emotional issues and behavioral issues, they're experiencing academic difficulties, that can also contribute to greater emotional regulation issues, particularly when an individual is experiencing frustration and failure. The expectation is this is going to continue. So I'm not experiencing success. So we certainly need to try to switch that and to develop some behavioral momentum, helping the individual to move toward a more positive experience in school, embracing some level of success and building and building upon that so that their experience is much more positive. Certainly the environment that we provide, so the educators in the environment, is it an inviting environment? That's going to go a long way in terms of the child's connectedness to the school environment, whether or not they want to be there, whether they're willing to be there, whether they show up and are an active member within that environment. So what does poor self-regulation mean and, and how do we understand that? So. In, in many ways, we can oversimplify it as the ability to manage and tolerate stress. So um, this morning, just about eight minutes before we got started, and some of you might have seen some carryover of that, uh, Denise and I, we were finalizing things for the webinar, and my desktop, where I'm speaking now, decided that it wanted to have an automatic restart. And I didn't even know that that was a thing, because I thought they were all re restarts that I needed to do rather than um, automatic restarts. In other words, that's how I thought I had my settings. But lo and behold, it automatically restarted. And hey, I had to have my backup plan. So I had my, my laptop beside me uh, and, and got that geared up and did my best to stay calm. Notice that, hey, this is a bit uncomfortable. Hopefully everything will work out. Uh, sure enough, it did, but I logged on with my laptop. And then once I got my desktop going at about nine o'clock or 9.01, then I switched back to the desktop. Okay. So um, managing and tolerating stress is really that hallmark of self-regulation because we have, I don't know, 60 some people here that are attending. I imagine many of you may have handled it the same way I have. I had handled it. Some of you may not have. Some of you may not have had a backup plan. Some of you may have quote unquote freaked out. Um, 
when you think about a child, perhaps a child may have dropped to the floor, rolled around, was kicking and screaming. Hopefully none of you would have handled it that way. But we are faced with things that are stressors in our life every day. How we cope with that, how we manage that is really going to be what is the significant difference between whether or not we're regulating emotions and behavior or we're not. So when we regulate those emotions and behavior, we're showing greater self-control. We can engage or participate more fully. We're able to be more compliant in our following of what the educator needs for us to do. We're also much more willing to accept feedback, right? So if I'm operating under a position that if you give me feedback, that's a terrible thing. And if you give me feedback, I want to escape and move away from what's uncomfortable, then what happens? Then we really see the child who's breaking down, they're having a meltdown or a tantrum. So the ability to be able to notice that discomfort and accept that discomfort and manage that discomfort is significant in terms of a predictor for their success. That's a lot different than there's stress and I want to get rid of stress. There's discomfort. I'm going to get rid of discomfort. The reality is we all live amongst where there is discomfort, especially if we care about something. So where do most kids get upset? They get upset in situations where they care. They care what someone has said to them. They care the way someone has looked at them. They care about how well or how poorly they've done in a social or academic situation. So it makes it much more likely that they're exposed to situations that can be stressful. And all of those difficulties can contribute to what you see here, impulsivity and aggression and noncompliance and arguing and withdrawal, uh, which makes it obviously harder for the child to engage in learning. So what are some of the physical manifestations of that? Sometimes they're headaches. Sometimes they are tension and pain. Sometimes you feel that right in your shoulder blades or right at the back of the neck. Sometimes we see some more significant health issues like fatigue and heart disease, cardiovascular related issues, in other words. Psychologically, certainly we're talking about some of the anxiety and depression, uh, depression and, and PTSD symptoms. We might even see for older individuals, beginnings of some substance abuse. We might see overeating. And as we talked about before, some of the self-harm behavior that may occur when there's really poor emotional regulation. What about that anxiety and coming back to, to that again? If, have you ever sort of been in a situation and you say, I'm just anxious about being, being anxious. You're, we might even call it anticipatory anxiety. You're anticipating that the situation that's coming up or that's like right there that you've just gotten into is making you anxious. And you're so anxious about becoming anxious. What do we do? We want to avoid that. Again, that happens a lot with that school refusal, but it also happens right in a situation where the child is anticipating you're gonna call on me, or he or she is gonna say something to me, or it's just not gonna work out okay. And the problem is that many times our youth do not communicate what they're feeling, what they're thinking. So as we go through this next video, I just want you to think for a moment about whether any of your students might be thinking this. And the more mindful we can be about that it may be there, the better we are able to assist our students.
worrying won't stop the bad stuff from happening. It just stops you from enjoying the good. Just let that resonate for a moment. Just watching that video again, and I've watched that many times, the one that I just shared, it reminds me of several students that I'm providing consultation for or treating and just thinking about those challenges. And, and, and one of the, the difficulties isn't just with the child's behavior, but how we respond to that as adults. So we find that in some situations we're tiptoeing around, or as we say, walking on eggshells, not wanting to disrupt the child by not calling on them first or the last child to line up or giving corrective feedback to the child or the child has difficulty with giving the correct answer and now they're feeling overly anxious. So parents get really concerned, well, you guys are triggering them or as educators, we get concerned. I don't wanna say or do something we'll, that will trigger her and have them go off with that behavior. Yet the reality that we really need to take time to appreciate is that for true emotional regulation, we need to help that individual to have exposure to that which is stressful rather than avoiding it because what happens is life inevitably contains stressful events and situations that contribute to discomfort so when we're in that situation if it feels like it's to use the baseball analogy it's bottom of the ninth two outs bases loaded two strikes on i'm up to bat and whether i get a hit or strike out or whatever it's going to happen that's going to determine how the game goes with 50,000 sets of eyes on me and millions of people watching, there's a high level of stress and anxiety that's then connected with that potentially. Unless I've had experiences and looked at what is my quote unquote relationship with stressful events. For many of our youth, the relationship with stress is that when stress comes in, I wanna push it away. In fact, I wanna struggle with it because I don't know how else, how else to deal with it. It becomes a tug of war. And if I can't get rid of the stress, then I'm fighting it. The fight, flight, freeze. If we could help individuals over time to be able to change that relationship, be more accepting of noticing that I have those thoughts and feelings of stress and role play and practice that I can get through that. I can manage that. Think about the first, second, 10th time that you were wearing a mask going out in public. And many educators and parents said, I don't think I can wear a mask for more than an hour. And now we have people that are wearing masks all day long with maybe a break or not for the you know mask wearing. So working through those stressful situations is one of the most challenging things, but trying to avoid stress and trying to get rid of it usually is not very successful. In fact, makes it more difficult for our youth. The other piece that plays into this is that one of the main theories and, and focus of treatment, um, we think about depression or self-harm or suicide, some, some of the more significant behavioral and emotional issues is that for many of our individuals, their what we call behavioral activation is low, meaning that they don't get started. So if you think about yourself, others you know, students, the idea of, well, when it's a new year, I'll get started. We have new year's resolutions or when the next month starts or I'll start this weekend, I'll start on my diet beginning tomorrow. I'll start exercising when I start feeling better. I'll get out of bed when, when I'm really feeling it. So the idea of putting it off until something happens. And what we see with depression is that there are low rates, rates of behavior, meaning we need to act first, feel better second. But many of our children, just like many adults, think and feel that I need to feel better first and then I'll do it. And particularly when we're experiencing distress, anxiety, discomfort, we think, well, that doesn't feel right, so I'm not gonna do it. But if you think about for yourselves, probably throughout your life, something that you really cared about, whether it was completing your degree, whether it was your first education opportunity, whether it was consulting or being involved in a really challenging case, um, whether it was a, a really big meeting or a presentation that you were giving, probably some of that stress and discomfort showed up and you would have preferred to feel completely 100% confident, completely 100% anxiety free. And that's not life. That's really not real life. We have to, if we care about something, we need to play through that and be willing to experience that discomfort. But for many of our youth, again, they have lots of these negative thoughts I refer to them and in our field refer, refer to them as the stinking thinking, the stinking thinking that shows up. 
I can't do this. This won't work out. This is terrible. It's unfair. They never let me do this or that. Um, they're always making me do this, which is a good segue to the notion of coercion, that for many of our youth, they have the experience at home and in school that you're telling me what to do and I have no choice. In fact, they hear that early on. You don't have a choice. You need to do this. You need to do that. The reality is everybody has a choice. The thing is, we want a child to do what we want them to do, and they want to do what they want to do. So we have a choice as an adult to look at what are the consequences, positive and negative, that would follow behavior of the child. And the child has the choice of how to, how to behave, ideally understanding what are the consequences of their behavior. But when a child feels coerced and feels like they're in that corner, what do they do? Fight, flight, or freeze. So we want to be able to help build in some choices so the child make some logical choices, can consider the outcomes of their behavior, understanding positive and negative what, what may occur, and they feel more empowered. As adults, we want the same thing, but that's going to take a, a bit of time because many youth who may find themselves in a specialized program have already had a, a long history of things not working out too well for them. So building that momentum, helping them to feel like they have some sense of empowerment and some choices while understanding consequences is a critical next step as well. Arming or providing supports the staff, of course that's critical. Can you help me, Mrs. Martin? This wasn't covered in any of my education courses. Well, fortunately, there's increasingly more behavioral support time provided in educational training, but the reality is that for many educators, having multiple students in a classroom or one student who has significant behavioral and emotional issues in their classroom that may be more overwhelming than any training they experience. Even for seasoned teachers, it doesn't necessarily get any easier. So what can we do in that way to provide some greater cohesion and support and coming together with the student? Are there some planned opportunities? Are you building into your day those opportunities to communicate and express feelings, whether it's a problem solving time, whether it's a group social skills group or group therapy, are the doors open figuratively and literally to go down to the guidance counselor? Are they open figuratively and literally to go to the child study team and to speak with someone? Or is somebody quote unquote always out to lunch and we can't meet with somebody and there's no backup plan? So where can I go? Is it inviting? How is that? received? Is it welcoming and supported? So that goes a long way. In a specialized program such as the ERI, Emotional Regulation Impairment Program at DLC, there is ongoing, not only planned individual and group counseling support, but staff that are available. And I think if you look at any environment in which you're providing that in your respective district, you want to be able to provide the same kind of thing. You want to make sure that those supports are continuously available, which we recognize sometimes can be a resource issue. Who is available to be able to provide that? So um, helping the individuals to understand the expectations and limits and helping them to know that they have someone they can go to to communicate. Do they feel safe? So as you walk into your respective buildings, as you walk into other buildings that you may be considering for a particular student, does it look like it's inviting? Does it look like that the students are safe and secure? How does staff interact with other staff? And how does staff interact with students and family members when they're coming in? Uh, what does that look like? How are issues of bullying and teasing and social isolation um, you know, addressed if they occur? Are they minimized so that they're less likely to occur in um, you know, in those situations. And we know that historically for students that have emotional regulation impairment, difficulties tend to occur more where? When there's less structure, less supervision. Therefore, what do we need to do? Make sure that you've got adequate level of structure and support and supervision in those situations that traditionally wouldn't have that. That means recess, lunch, transitions and some of the specials periods as well. You wanna make sure that you have staff that are well-trained, that are utilizing the same language, the same social emotional learning approaches across situations. That requires dedicated consultation, training, and collaboration for that to occur so that you're on the proverbial same page. Making sure that we're also providing a, a lot more positive regard compared to redirection. So we wanna make sure that we're continually giving behavior specific praise we say at least a ratio of four positive for every one negative, and that'll go a long way in, in 
really developing what we want to be seeing more often uh, so that we can get ahead of those behaviors. And as it says here, it's much easier to prevent a behavior from occurring than to deal with it after it's happened. So what do you do when the child's ready to throw the chair? Well, hopefully you've put in place some good strategies. If not, just make sure you get out of the way, right? So all joking aside, we really wanna make sure that proactively we've got those antecedent interventions. Um, while this is back from 2003, um, every time I look at this slide, there's just the reinforcement that all of these components continue to be critical. What is the environment, uh, environmental management? How are we setting up the classroom and the school so that we're promoting successful engagement of the students, good control of the environment, clear rules and, and expectations? How are we delivering positive regard and reinforcement? What are we doing when there are negative behaviors? How are we addressing the emotional uh, learning, the social emotional learning through what's called affective education? Now, we, we'd refer to that more as social emotional learning. Are we individualizing and making sure we understand the individual students because that's important. It's not a one size fits all. Are we seeing good academic success through momentum? Start with a little bit of success and keep that going and going and going so we're less likely to see challenging behaviors. And are we planning for what the future looks like? Why? Because our students wonder, what is the value of this? What is, how is this connected? I don't understand how this all fits together. While you won't necessarily be targeting lots of career planning with a second, third, fourth, fifth grader, you do wanna to start to get those components early on in their schooling so that they understand what's the connection, at least into the community. What's the carryover into my house? What's gonna happen from this situation out to recess? And for the older guys, whether in middle school or high school, now, what is that starting to look like more and more into social situations and for career interests I might have and working toward greater independence. So we need to plan proactively for that as well. What about in situations? So if we break it down to the three C's really, or the, the two C's here, but Q, coach, and you know critical feedback, but here we have review, Q, coach, and review. We wanna be able to prime or get the child ready. We wanna be able to coach them and give them some reminders and prompts during a situation, deliver reinforcement, visual cues where we can, less verbal cues, and provide some feedback about how do you think that went? What do you think happened? Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple um, slides in, in a moment that will help you to process what that situation is. We also have the four Ps. So let's point out. So it looked like you had some difficulty with keeping your hands to yourself. It looks like you had some difficulty in using your feeling words to communicate. Here's what you could do. Let's prompt the child. And when that occurs, let's provide some behavior specific feedback through praise and continue to practice that continuously so it's going to be more ingrained for the child. Just a brief word on rules, routines, and reinforcement. In the beginning of the year, here we are toward the end of the year, so it's never too late, but continuously you wanna make sure you have clear rules established. If we wanna promote emotional regulation, students need to know what are the behavioral expectations in the classroom, what are the social expectations, and what are the positive and negative consequences that are gonna follow? What happens when I call out? What happens when I use profanity? What happens if I throw something? What happens if my head is down and I'm not participating? How will you, the adults, respond to me so I know what to expect? Of course, some of that's gonna be fluid. It's gonna change a little bit depending upon the individual child. So one of the, you know, the sayings we have in the field, so just like if you're familiar with real estate and they say, what's the most important thing, the three most important things in real estate, location, 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 right? So in education, the most important thing, the three most important things, is structure, structure, structure. However, we wanna tweak that and say structure, 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 but with some flexibility. That means that probably the most effective teacher to help Johnny who has autism or Johnny who has ADHD or Johnny who has depression is a Johnny friendly teacher, a teacher who provides good, strong structure, yet with the flexibility balance there that they can individualize things for Johnny. When you have eight Johnnies in a classroom, that's a lot more difficult. Yet that is going to be the road towards success to provide support appropriately for quote unquote, the Johnnies who need that so that we can meet what their individualized needs are. Reviewing those rules, of course, discussing them, practicing them, what if charts, 
having a daily scorecard. So it's something that we incorporate in our Eagle, soon to be ERI program. We provide that daily feedback, helping students to be able to monitor their progress. And you don't wanna just say, here's how you've done, here are how many points you've received, but to be able to review with them. How do you think you did with sitting at your desk to work? How do you think you did with showing self-control during the social studies lesson? Talk to me about how you did with lining up. If we can help a child to engage in some self-appraisal, that's gonna go a long way. And then if you can get to the next part, which is let's work in a small group, let's give each other some feedback. That is the students giving one another feedback. That requires, of course, having a thicker skin to accept when you're receiving feedback from another child. But that's something that you can work toward over the course of the school year. But again, just be really mindful that we don't want to just tell a child, here's what you did, whether you got a happy face or a sad face, or you got zero, one, two, five, ten points, but to engage in a dialogue so that they can have some greater sense of how they're doing so that they can then improve their behavior and be more mindful of what that looks like. Here are some components. Again, once you have a copy of the, the PowerPoint, you'll have some greater detail here, but we can be able to monitor going back to the slide for a moment at the bottom. You can see how many happy faces they've earned or how many points they've earned. That can easily translate to a percentage so that we can monitor progress and we can graph and analyze that. Uh, just a word on catch being good. You want to make sure you're praising the behavior instead of good job or good boy, good girl. I really like how you used your feeling words. I really like how you stayed calm or good job staying calm by using an inside voice. So the more specific we can be, the better that's going to be. And also be careful not to zap it. You did a great job with completing your, your school assignment, but you should have done that 20 minutes ago. Now, we don't want to zap that at the end because that loses the value of the reinforcement that you just provided. Uh, certainly, we know there are different levels of reinforcement. If you remember uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we really start, at least in an educational setting, there might be some tangible or food items and working up to social praise. And ideally, we'd get to the point where the child is behaving appropriately because it's the right thing to do. And we know that that's a lot harder for many individuals to appreciate and value and have the empathy to understand that. But that is what we're trying to work for and work toward is the understanding that it is helpful being in a society to engage in desired behavior. But for many of our, our youth, we're going to need to provide some more tangible, concrete reinforcers to get going and making sure that it's attainable. You know, we want to have something that is reachable, starting off with good early success and then kind of. Uh, moving in that positive direction and fading reinforcers. We can post caught being good. That gives some public display to help to increase as well. Um, sharing that, it doesn't need to be a note. It could be an email. It could be a phone call to communicate, share with parents how the child was doing can reinforce that. Um, some programs we see, uh, I'm seeing more and more of these use, utilizing Class Dojo as a way, if you're not familiar with it, it it's a great um, kid-friendly way and staff-friendly way to provide um, feedback, not just for individuals that have developmental delays. I've seen this in many general education classrooms where we can give immediate feedback about behavior, uh, academic success, some of those readiness skills to really shape emotional regulation. Uh, and it's great because the student receives that feedback without the staff member having to continuously come over to them. How we greet students, of course, we're not shaking hands nowadays, but you know, making sure that the environment is inviting. Does the child feel comfortable when they're walking in, as I was mentioning before? So uh, starting off the day in a positive way can go a long way. So what does that systematic plan look like? So as we start to put this together and build it out, so we think about the success for adequately, appropriately, successfully supporting students who have emotional regulation difficulties. You have to have a clear component of direct instruction. That means set aside time specifically to be teaching social emotional learning. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And then also embedding and, and or infusing social emotional learning throughout the day. It's not just important during that daily 30 minutes or twice a week social emotional learning twice a week. We need to embed that throughout all of what we're doing, whether it's during a physical education activity, a language arts activity, a math activity. And for those individuals that have more difficulty regulating their emotions, they need that more embedded and infused throughout their day. 
That's why many individuals will have difficulties in, in some more of traditional learning environments because it's harder to infuse and spend time really integrating some of the social emotional learning supports and certainly having a positive culture and climate that throughout the building we have that that it's not just autism awareness month but we have awareness throughout the entire year for individuals that have different abilities whether it's down syndrome autism spectrum whether there are cognitive deficits speech difficulties difficulties with motor skills adhd symptoms that the culture and climate really supports that and makes it a place that is more comfortable. So it's really engaging the learner in a lot more um, empathic way as they go throughout their day. So we can achieve those positive results. Uh, you might have, have seen some format of this. This is through CASEL, which is uh, no coincidence also on the New Jersey Department of Education's website as New Jersey Department of Ed has ad adapted and adopted uh, you know, Castle's model, the wheel here. And you see right in the middle of social emotional learning and what goes around that are the key components, critical components to promote social emotional learning, which we need to be covering to successfully help individuals with regulating their emotions. Self-management, so in no particular order, but we'll go clockwise. Self-management, the ability to manage and control one's own behaviors, certainly regulation goes right there. Responsible decision making, and social problem solving, if you've heard of that, and there's a lot of programming, a lot of curricula that's out there on social problem solving. Relationship skills, so peer to peer and peer to adult. Social awareness, so that's your empathy, your perspective taking. How does my behavior impact you? Theory of mind, being able to put myself in your shoes, imagining what you may be thinking and feeling. That is absolutely a skill that we can build. And it's never too late. Uh, we may require a lot more visuals, a lot more video supports, a lot more practice, and we can build it. Self-awareness. So a connection of how am I in this world and this environment? How does my behavior not only affect others, but what does it do for me? Is this working out for me or is it not working out? And how do I adjust this? So what does that look like in your classroom? What does it look like across the school building? What does it look like in the larger community and in the family? So this is really the essence of social emotional learning. So to do justice to it, having a five minute morning meeting a couple of days a week is not really going to be successful for individuals that we would typically characterize under that tier two or tier three. So your learners that have an accommodation plan or an IEP, they're going to need a lot more intensity, a lot more duration of social emotional learning. Just like an individual that has a significant learning disability, we're going to be providing some significant supports in the area of phonemic awareness or helping them with their, you know, their one-to-one -one correspondence, their math skills. So for social emotional learning, that needs to be a critical component, really infused. As my colleague Steve Gordon likes to say, we need to bathe the children in social emotional learning when that's their core deficit or at least if that's a significant deficit for them and uh, really making sure we're setting aside time and infusing that. As Maya Angelou says, I've learned what, that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So what is that feeling and that connection that students have day in and day out? And that means particularly in a school setting where students will be doing more and more transitioning as restrictions lessen uh, within this pandemic or endemic that we need to make sure that all staff are on the proverbial same page the staff that are present in the cafeteria and on the playground the staff that are in the specials area teachers and the multiple different academic teachers particularly in middle school and as we go up to high school we need to make sure that there is that consensus and consistency in terms of the language the approaches the reinforcement the redirection as it's needed and that we're infusing that social emotional learning across all of those situations on all of those people. So any turnkeying that you do as a result of today, make sure that you're tapping into all of those individual staff members that may have some interaction with that student, because all it takes is, you know, one bump in the road, and then we may have a major issue, and that can be hard to recover. 
I won't go into all the details here, but just know, please, that there is a significant amount of research. It's actually now this has been dated about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago. There are multiple meta analysis that is pulling together lots and lots of research that that really reflects the significant efficacy of social emotional learning to improve emotional regulation areas. So not only resulting in more pro-social skills, but decreasing significantly the conduct problems. Additionally, what you should know is that the research uh, shows that somewhere between 11 to about 13 or 14 percentage points, we see improved academically, meaning that when students are receiving social emotional learning programming, we see on average about 11 to 13 point improvement academically, which means that the concerns we have, many of us may have about when we're providing social emotional learning for individuals that have emotional regulation impairment, and even those who don't, that we're missing out on a lot of critical academic time. Well, the reality is we actually see a boost in students' academic success when we provide social emotional learning. So I think the, the notion research supports this of teaching social problem solving, teaching awareness and understanding and perspective taking, has a lot of overlap with a lot of the educational instruction that we're doing in other areas. What are some additional ways to incorporate this? Well, we want to teach students working toward helping them to become more independent in their ability to problem solve. So when we're working with a learner, it's not just the adult prompting them and cueing them and reminding them and then we want the child to do it. We want our children to become adults in this world who can be thinking and acting and displaying desired behaviors without the reliance of an adult on their proverbial shoulders. Excuse me. So helping them to be able to, as they say, learn to fish, you know, rather than just giving them the fish. We want them to be able to acquire and um, develop those skills so that becomes embodied in what they do. So we want to gradually systematically fade prompts and put su students in situations where there are more and more practice opportunities so that they can shine. And that way you're going to see that carry over increasingly more. How else can we regulate? So for some learners, they do great with identifying and communicating feeling words, although not necessarily at the right time. Yet for other learners, we might see that they don't have the vocabulary. So we might start with helping them to know that it's going to be an up feeling or a down feeling. And what are some of those examples of up feelings? So not just that I feel good, but I feel happy or I feel excited. And do I feel a little bit happy? or a lot happy, but feel a little excited or a lot excited because a lot excited can look a lot different than a little excited and a lot excited can be overwhelming for the child, for the peers and staff. What about down feelings? Instead of just, I feel bad or I feel, um, I feel sad or mad. What about worried? And what about anxious, frustrated, embarrassed? So the argument here would be that there is really pretty much every occasion we could identify a feeling word that precedes anger. Again, embarrassment, frustration, disappointment, worry, anxiety, scared, sad, sleepy. So think about when you felt angry, what preceded that? If we can provide students with the ability to understand and communicate their feelings, then they're better able to get to a point before frustration, anger, and aggression helping them also to identify and connect with what they care about. So what's important to them. So it's actually a, a critical skill that I can notice my discomfort. I can notice my feelings. I can notice I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed and I'm calm, right? So as I gave that personal example when starting the webinar, right? So there was some uh, annoyance or frustration that the, that my computer was restarting. And I stayed calm. I think Denise would, you know, attest to that. Does that happen 100% of the time? No, but I do my best. For students that have emotional regulation impairment, it is much more likely the case that when they're experiencing, and they don't always necessarily notice it right away, but when they're experiencing those down feelings, what goes along with that is acting out behavior. We need to be able to help them to be able to have those uncomfortable feelings and to be able to stay keep their body calm. And that's going to happen through practice. So I feel frustrated when I'm noticing this. My mind is telling me that I want to quit. My mind is telling me I can't raise my hand. So we see 
a lot of rigidity, especially individuals who are on the autism spectrum, but also for individuals that are just, you know, showing lots of, of difficulty in transitioning and being able to, um, you know, have that understanding that there's a different way I can act. So when we see that rigidity, together with the frustration tolerance being low, together with poor ability to communicate emotions, what do we see? Kind of a recipe for a meltdown. So helping them to communicate their emotions more calmly, helping them to be able to get themselves calmer, slowing the breathing down, and being able to know that I have some confidence I can work through the situation. So part of the emotional regulation training is helping the indiv individual to have an awareness about what are those automatic responses. It's why as you look at these, um, these bullet points, many individuals will liken feeling highly stressed or panicked with what? With a heart attack. I'm having a heart attack. No, you could be having a panic attack or at least feeling some level of stress. So helping individuals to notice that my heart rate's starting to beat faster. I'm starting to have a louder voice. My muscles are feeling more tense. Maybe I'm feeling hot and turning red. So as I start to notice that, what can I do? So I can focus on my breath. I can come back to some of that mindful breathing. I can know that I can go to a get calm area. Um, so we need to be able to have that in our repertoire, assuming we've practiced it. And if you haven't practiced it, it's not muscle memory. It's why any good athlete, any good musician, anybody who's good at riding a bike, what have they done? Thousands and thousands and thousands of times they've practiced it, right? We hear that magic number 10,000. But it's not just 10,000 times of doing something. It's with focused intention and attention. I have the intention because I care about it and I'm sustaining my attention and practicing and practicing and practicing. But for many of our youth, they don't necessarily have ample opportunities to practice. So what happens? Their, their emotions, as the phrase used in the field, their emotions are hijacked. Their ability to handle the situation doesn't work well. And we see meltdowns. Conversely, if we help them to build that muscle memory that when there's a stressful situation, they don't resource to having a meltdown. They're able to call on some strategies they've used. Why, hopefully, if you were in a store and somebody called you a name, that your immediate response is not to start throwing things and kicking and cursing and having a tantrum and engaging in a physical confrontation, but to handle that with greater maturity and calmness and confidence. And that's what we're trying to really promote for our students. We can teach them how to breathe, right? We call this four square breathing where I'm gonna breathe in and hold that for four seconds. And then I'm gonna gradually breathe that out for four seconds and then hold that once the breathing is out for four seconds and then breathe in again for four seconds and then hold that for four seconds. And we just kind of work through this. And, and if you're reading this and looking and saying, boy, that sounds a little bit clumsy, you probably haven't done it before. It takes some time to work through that breathing to just become more connected and to slow things down. What we also encourage youth to do is during that time when they're working on slowing their breathing down is to be contemplating, what's my next step? What am I going to do next? Am I going to go to the get calm area or the peace zone area so that I can have a chance to decompress? Or I'm going to go say to the staff member, I need some help. I'm feeling frustrated. Am I going to change my, my feelings picture, my, my emotion visual on the chart from calm to frustrated or from frustrated to calm? So having some way to think about what is my next step that I might have as we go through. Progressive muscle relaxation. To be clear, we're not saying that the solution is just to take breaths and to relax, but if we can help the individual to get in a more relaxed state, they may be more engaging with the idea of communicating feelings, keeping their body calm, calling on the fact that we've practiced this a hundred times and here's what I can do when someone calls me a name. Here's what I can do when I'm feeling frustrated. So we can just you know, notice what the difference is between having tense muscles and relaxed muscles. So this isn't something that necessarily we say, okay, go into progressive muscle relaxation right now because you're angry, but more so helping individuals to work on some mindfulness work throughout the day so that their body is better able to work through those stressful situations, more able and ready to engage in 
the desired skills they need to communicate and to cope with the situation. For some individuals, they might find that within the calm area or safe haven, depending upon their particular age, they have some things that will also be soothing and calming. Again, giving them something to replace is not the solution, but it may be a short-term way to help them to decompress. Ultimately, we've got to put in the hard work. We've got to practice. We've got to practice. We've got to set aside that time. But having some visuals, uh, again, kid-friendly, depending upon their age and their cognitive level, can go a long way. Um, so if I had the ability to see everybody raising hands or not, the question I would ask next here is, how many of you have used video modeling, right? And usually in a, in a pretty decent group like this of, of 60 people, we'd have you know, a handful of people, maybe they would raise their hand. And then if I asked you, have you ever gone on YouTube and learned how to fix something or learn how to bake something, or you've watched a, a video model of how to improve a particular skill, pretty much everybody nowadays would raise their hand. There've been many things I fixed around the house successfully through watching a video that otherwise I wouldn't have had a clue to do, right? Like replacing the drum or in the air, in the, in the washing machine or um, changing an electric, um, you know, socket. So we watch someone doing it with clear direction and modeling, and then we do it. So video modeling is a strong evidence-based approach that we can incorporate with helping individuals to regulate their emotions. So video modeling is where the adult, or it could be another child, is going to demonstrate the desired behavior and describe it. And we're videotaping it, of course, with permission, um, if it's a child that we're videotaping. And then we're going to show it to the child, and the child will then duplicate or replicate that behavior, and we're giving them feedback. Video self-modeling would be where we have permission from the parent to videotape the child so the child can see their own behavior, and that also is another evidence-based approach. So uh, it's pretty easy and, and quick to make a video model. Uh, there also are um, various video, video modeling series that you can um, then you can Google and, and learn about. Um, and there are various videos, if you check them out uh, on YouTube, that could be appropriate models as well for shaping desired behavior, like getting calm and communicating feelings and, and social problem solving. Um, we have about a little more than 15, uh, 18 minutes left in, in, the, uh, in the webinar, and I'm gonna go through a few more slides. We will take some Q&A, but if for some reason people are unable to mute or choose not to mute, feel free to start putting some of your questions in the Q&A so that it, with the last um, five or seven minutes, then I'll do my best to answer some of those questions that you might have. So again, uh, feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A um, if we're not able to get to um, having people unmuted. Um, let me go through a few more slides here. So how do we help people to regulate? We've talked about feelings, identification, and checking in throughout the day. So the more that someone can be in touch with and mindful of their emotions and that our feelings change, the better they are able to regulate. So how you feel on a Monday morning might be a lot different than how you feel on a Friday afternoon. And how you feel on a Friday evening may be a lot more, uh, a lot difficult than how you feel on a Sunday evening getting ready for work the next day. Additionally, I would add that some of the key skills that often result in challenging behaviors when they're not present and where they're not mastered are learning to wait, accepting no, accepting help or asking for help, seeking attention appropriately, and asking for missing or needed items. For those of you that are involved with behavioral plans, if you think about that almost always challenging behavior has something to do with one of those or more of those behavioral uh, skills that we need to shape. So what we really should be doing is for all learners, be teaching them those critical, essential, functional skills. The notion I mentioned before is helping the individual to be able to communicate and have an awareness that I can feel frustrated and I can stay calm and safe. For many individuals, they don't, they see them as mutually exclusive. If I'm frustrated, how can I stay calm? Do you know any adults that have that difficulty, right? When somebody gets frustrated, they throw a golf club, they hang up the phone, they scream or they curse. So we wanna shift that. We wanna shift that thinking and shift that behavior that we can feel a negative feeling and we can be calm. That's the essence of that flexibility. That's working through that rigidity that we might have. 
And an individual that has more difficulty with cognitive skills or language skills, we might incorporate more visuals. But we want to be able to help them and be able to modulate and notice those different emotions and how those feelings may change. You're just seeing a couple of different check-ins here for feelings. A, a strategy I often recommend is called situations in a hat. And you can modify however you want, whether you have a hat, whether you have a container, that staff and parents could develop some situations that are common triggers for the child, put them in the hat or the container. And as part of the educational program every morning or every afternoon, we're gonna set aside five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it may be, pull a situation out of a hat, we're gonna review it, we're gonna discuss it, we're gonna practice that, and we're gonna give the kids corrective feedback whether every child has their own hat or there's one hat for the classroom, we're really trying to give ample opportunity to provide practice, exposure to those situations that tend to be stressful. And you can just make this very fluid. You can add to that as the year goes on. You've heard of social stories, but social stories are really the, the brand name, the generic name is a social narrative. So you can have a social narrative, certainly add photos, visuals to that. So here's a social narrative for playing games. So helping a child to understand what might happen, how would I feel, what is the desired thing to do. So for some children, utilizing social narratives can be very helpful to prime them and get them prepared for social situations that are more challenging. Aside from the name, and that is uh, what Brenda Smith Miles uh, came up with, social autopsies, um, it's a really good strategy is to process with the child what happened, what was the problem. Um, I have incorporated that into a strategy called the learning my feelings log, which you can certainly use. Again, all of this will be included in the PowerPoint where we ask the child what happened, who was that person, where were you, how did you feel, how strong were your feelings, and how did you respond to that? How did you handle yourself? So some self-appraisal. And you see at the bottom, we're going to role play. What could we do next? So what is, how could we handle this and improve this for the next time? So that, again, that critical practice becomes incorporated. And I encourage parents and staff to use this feelings log, not when the child has difficulty, but also when they handle things well, so they can have a better sense of what is the desired behavior. Hey, I did a good job. And you didn't just pull out this form because I had a, a significant uh, level of difficulty. What else can we do? So you saw in that, that video earlier about planned ignoring. So when the behavior is primarily for attention seeking, well, what can we do? We can plan to ignore that. Of course, time and place is important. So if the child is having a tantrum when you're in the aisle getting ready to purchase something in the supermarket, that makes it a lot harder to plan to ignore. But if we don't ignore and we give attention, what is that doing? It's giving a lot of reinforcement to the child's behavior, their attention seeking behavior. So uh, we also have to be aware of what's called the extinction burst, if you haven't heard of that. And that's important to educate all staff in a classroom that we might be doing a good job ignoring, ignoring, ignoring. And what does the child want? Well, the child may not be on board with that intervention and thinking, well, in the past you paid attention to me. So now you're ignoring me. What am I going to do? I'm going to raise the bar. I'm going to be a lot louder. I'm going to be more mobile. I'm going to be more disruptive. So we need to be more, um, you know, involved in, in terms of our plan, making sure that we're ignoring, yet we have to have that line in the sand. At what point do we intervene? At what point does this become dangerous and significantly disruptive? And that's one of those delicate balances that you have to be thinking about when you have an individualized plan, because if you're ultimately going to intervene, you're ultimately giving attention, and that's feeding what the child's behavior is, yet we have to be able to balance that with safety and security in a classroom and educating the other individuals. Giving corrective feedback, I know you're excited and upset about what happened. Please take a deep breath. Tell me calmly what happened so I can understand and best help you. So giving that behavior-specific feedback you know, kind of acknowledging what was going on, validating feelings, trying to promote the child to engage in some communication with us. So timeout. Does timeout work? Well, it could. It's supposed to be timeout as a way from attention. What I prefer is more of a sit and watch procedure where we're going to pull the child, not I shouldn't say pull, but we're going to with prompting, 
uh, prompt the child to move away from the situation uh, where we can and have the child watch how others are displaying the desired behavior. So they're gonna sit and watch, they're gonna sit and think and watch the desired behavior instead of saying, okay, you go over here and when you can figure out how to play nicely or how to sit nicely, then you can come back. Well, how are they supposed to figure that out? Are they supposed to go on their phone and, and kind of Google what the desired behavior is? Um, no. So we can have some teaching interaction, have some discussion with them, have them watch uh, what others are doing after withdrawing some of that attention that they were previously receiving. So we can ask some questions like, why are you in sit and watch? What should you have done instead? Show me how, to, how you do that. Uh, great job showing me, now let's bring you back. Um, depending upon the function and behavior, we may need to, to modify that. Positive practice that may be used, for example, a child who's running from the bathroom to the classroom or a child who is calling out. So we may have them practice multiple times raising their hand, practice multiple times walking from the bathroom to the classroom. We're really trying to ingrain in them that desired behavior multiple times. We're not talking about hundreds of times, but multiple times, maybe two, three, four times for them to practice that so that we're really trying to build up that skill and so they understand the expectation. If I act out, if I don't follow the rule, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna need to come back and do that multiple times anyway. Some do's and don'ts as we're, we're winding down here. So avoid, we'll see. It's very vague. So when can I have that reward? Well, we'll see. It depends on how you are. No, make it very clear and specific. When you do this, then this will happen. And it should be clear, visual. Students should understand what are the behavioral expectations, and what can I earn? What can I receive as a result of that? Okay. Um, think about this. If you've told a child a thousand times and they still don't understand, then it's probably not the child who's having trouble learning. We've got to step back and think about what can I be doing? How can I make a difference here? Some quick tips, daily success for the students, lots and lots of practice. So we want to be, you know, active rather than passive. Don't just sit back and wait, but be in there and provide behavior specific praise. Encourage the students also to appraise their own behavior. And we don't view the behavior or the child as a problem that I have to deal with, but really an opportunity where I can help educate this child. And that has to be ingrained throughout the program. As staff, we need to be positive, available, skilled, validating. So the more we can have that among all of our staff, the more likely we are to be successful, not just a, an individual where the child has to be pulled out to go meet with that staff member, but you really want to ingrain that among all of your staff members so that that is really a fluid part of your programming, ideally in all of the settings within the school building. Again, meeting with early success, we talked about promoting strengths. Um, here are some strategies in terms of minimizing confrontations. Um, so there's some steps here. You can review this as a team can go a long way. Sitting down, soft inside voice, often are some really key components to that. Collaborating with parents to promote that carryover. And what I want you to think about as we uh, wrap up and we're gonna take some Q&A in a moment is think about what is the one thing, the next one thing that you can do. So we've sat here for almost an hour and a half it's a lot of material. You guys will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Hopefully a couple of things are reinforcing for you, maybe a couple of new strategies. What is the one thing that you can do after leaving this webinar that can make a meaningful difference among your students, among a student in your caseload, among a student in your classroom, within your school or in your district? What is one thing you could do? Take a moment and jot that down, write it down somewhere. Then decide when you're going to do this. So we all have devices. So pick up your device. Decide a time and place that you can commit to that where no, nothing else will get in the way. Nothing else is scheduled. You're going to protect that like you'd have a really important doctor's appointment. So plan for that. What time, what day will you do that next one thing that can make a meaningful difference in improving the education, the lives, of an individual who has difficulty with controlling their emotions and their behavior in your school, in your building, on your caseload. Let's keep moving forward. And as Helen Keller's quote uh, communicates alone, we can do so little together, we can do so much. 
You'll see at the end of the PowerPoint, there are some related resources, which you'll have a, a chance to peruse, some information about uh, our practice and some materials that we have from our practice um, as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and it looks like there may be a couple questions. Uh, so Denise, if, if you're available and can, can rejoin as well. Um, so I see, how can you relate this to, or can you provide further examples for high school students? So, you know, the, the, the key when we, when we think about, you know, uh, the older population, I, I think it becomes increasingly more important to help individuals to make a connection with what matters to me. So one of the things I'll often do if I go into a, a group uh, in, in a classroom, behavioral disabilities classroom, or now we refer to as an ERI uh, classroom, is I might draw a big heart on, on the screen or on the whiteboard. And after you get a little bit of chuckles from the students, I'm asking them really, what matters to you? What's important to you? Uh, what do you really care about? And you get answers like my dog, my friends, my music, my video games, um, and, and try to move that toward what else they care about. Often it's it's independence. It's, I, hey, I want money. I want to be able to buy things. So can we make some connection between participating in school and success with some of the things that they care about? And it may seem like a big leap for kids, especially when they're saying, oh man, that, I don't believe this. I don't care. And they're putting their head down. But if we can move toward helping them make a connection with their value system and ideally looping parents in on that, we might have some more success. Um, how do you come up with or find the lessons you want to implement for counseling? Can you recommend some online tools that you've liked? Um, I guess I want to refrain from recommending any specific interventions per se here. Uh, there are a ton of social emotional learning strategies and curricula that exist. If you go on to Castle, C-A-S-E-L.org website, you'll see there are many curricula that they share that they have found that are successful. Um, if somebody wants to email me uh, directly, I'd be happy to share more individually some of the curriculum that um, I found a, a, you know, success with in, in schools where I consult or in our, our own practice. But there's, there's no one size fits all. The key really is that you're going to have a sustained intervention where ideally you're teaching the core social emotional learning, yet also individualizing for the students that have um, more specific needs. So um, does it need to be a specific consumable workbook? Does it need to be um, you know, video-based? It really depends upon what some of your preferences, what your flexibility is in your program, but um, please know that there are a ton of resources that are available. You have one more question. I don't know if you see that. It's in the chat. Okay. Let me. Uh, it's about buy-in. How do oh, you get staff to buy-in? How do you get staff to buy-in? So that that's a that's a great question because uh, it's not an easy one. Uh, so some of you might know the name Marie Elias. Marie Elias is uh, internationally known and and he's homegrown. He's he's from New Jersey and and works and lives in New Jersey. And I've had the uh, the great pleasure of collaborating with Maurice and and many of his students from from Rutgers. Um, he does a lot of work in the area of social emotional learning. And one of the things that, that he talks about, which I also you know, reinforce is that when you're, when you're looking at a school, it's usually a three-year plan at the minimum to really turn a school around where year one, it, it's working on that buy-in. You're really educating staff about the importance of social emotional learning. While we, we can say you shouldn't have to, that is the reality of you know, doing something different and dedicating that time. You absolutely need administrative support. So, when it's if it's and when it's presented as it's a nice to do or nice to have, most things don't get done. If you think about technology or new curriculum for math, right, the principal or the you know superintendent or director of curriculum doesn't say, "I'd like if you guys would consider start doing this." No, they say, "We're rolling this out. Here are the the professional development training days. You guys need to start doing this, and here's the accountability." And the support we're going to provide. So for social emotional learning, it would be the same thing. You know, we have a number of individuals that have significant difficulties with emotional regulation impairment in our building, in our district. We need to increase our supports. We're going to have professional development. We have we're going to meet and talk about curricula that we're going to purchase, classroom materials that we're going to have. We're going to provide some follow-up consultation, and here's our plan. So when a, a school personnel approaches me and says, Hey, Mike, what do you suggest in terms of um, 
you know, curriculum, I don't say, oh, you should use our curriculum that we develop. No, I say, talk to me about what your needs are, because depending upon the needs, depending upon what they currently have, and depending on where they are in the buy-in, that's going to determine a lot what our next steps are, right? Because you can't just say, here, here's curricula, start using it. You may have, a, they may be a lot further along and you need to look at um, how do we increase some of that training and support for some of that buy-in because oftentimes staff do appreciate the value of social emotional learning. They just don't know where and when they're going to fit it into their day. And they also think, oh, this is the next flavor of the month. Oh, well, we had character education and we had, you know, uh, 50 things that we could do that are nice for one another. Like, so what's going on here? We had morning meeting, we had responsive classroom. So what's this all about? So I think you really need to be able to sit and listen and, and have that dialogue. I don't see any other questions at, at, at the moment and I see that we're at 1030. So again, I wanna remind you, if you have questions or, or comments, uh, feel free to email me. I know that uh, Denise and her team will be sending out the, the PowerPoint to everybody that, um, that registered. So I, I know Denise will have some closing words, but I just wanna thank everybody for your participation. I, I know it was a kind of a social emotional learning blitz here that we covered a lot of information in, in a relatively short period of time and um, hope that you found it to be helpful. And I want to thank you as well, Dr. Selps, for giving all those strategies. It's great information. And as you said, we will be sending out the PowerPoint. I will also put a brochure about our emotional regulation impairment program. That will have all contact information, and Dr. Self has his contact information also on the PowerPoint. So there's lots of good things. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to any of us. And I hope you have a good afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Denise and DLC. Bye. -bye.